We are going to jump into an interesting passage of Scripture today in 1 John chapter 2. And um, this, is, this section of Scripture is the kind of section, whether you read, um, <laughs> whether you, you watch real news or fake news, um, this is the kind of passage of Scripture that those people that uh, watch news all day like to, to come to this passage of Scripture, complain about the world going to hell in a handbasket, and then tweet their, their things on social media about how frustrated they are, and that's all that they ever really do about it, right? Um, this, is, this is one of those passages where, where, where Christians just like to talk about the word Antichrist is going to come up. They like to talk about the end of the world and they we all just hunker down build our bunkers and it's over right like we have no victory to celebrate in Jesus and what God's called us to do is to walk in fear like if that's you this passage is going to particularly draw you in but I want to walk through this passage for more more than just walking in fear as a body of believers in fact I, I think a spirit of fear the Bible tells us in Timothy is not what God calls us to but power love and a sound mind okay and so when you look at this passage there's a healthy way to approach it but what John is doing as we've come to, to learn about John and understand John, uh, John is a disciple that, that deeply loved Jesus, his life radically transformed by Christ, where he went from a, an individual labeled as a son of thunder, where he, he punched you in the nose first and he asked questions later. He, he was one of wrath, not one of grace. God radically changes his life, and John is seen as, as he grows in Jesus as one that deeply loves people, so much so that some people might even think that you can take advantage of that love. And what you see in 1 John is that John John, while he walks in love, he also stands in truth and is willing to, to, to stand for that truth when persecution comes. His life even resonated with that to the point that he was, he was persecuted for his faith, he was boiled alive, survived, was exiled to the island of Patmos. He stood for Jesus in adversity. And so he's communicating in this book what it means to know God in his love while standing for the truth of God as a follower of Jesus and how that should look in a healthy way. And he, and he parallels it between between these two ideas of darkness and light, that God represents what is light. He is pure. He is holy. We saw the goodness of God last week in, in his propitiation as our advocate, that he, 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 he argues for us and in our innocence, and he propitiates, he satisfies the wrath of God for us by his sacrifice on the cross. And so you see this, this beauty of God in his grace and in his holiness and in his light in the midst of what darkness is, that when God has called us uh, to to belong to him. He, he's called us to not be of this world, but in this world and to represent the light of God in the midst of darkness. And so within this book, you see this parallel uh, uh, of believers walking this world in the midst of light and, and pursuing God around us with, with the darkness that is represented by, by the kingdom of darkness. You know, when you think about this world that we walk in, and what God has called us to, I think anything worthwhile in life has a, a battle. And you need to just make sure that you're fighting for the right thing. You want to do great things for God, expect great battles for God. Things don't come easy when, it, when it's for the Lord because there is the, a kingdom of light and there is a kingdom of darkness. I think sometimes as Christians, we get off to the wrong foot when we confuse who the enemy is. I mean, Paul even acknowledges in, in Ephesians chapter 6, he says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against spiritual forces of darkness, that our enemy is not people. But rather than fight against them, God calls us to fight for them, just like Jesus came and, and fought for us. And so it's on the backdrop of, of, of those thoughts that John now starts in verse 12 of, of, of 1 John chapter 2, encouraging you as a believer in this world that you live in to be a light for Christ. And, and I love the way that he represents it. If you, if you read in your Bible, if you have it open to that section of scripture, most translations will take verse 12 to 14 and they'll sort of do this indentation of this passage of scripture because they want us to recognize that as John's writing this letter, he does something a little unique in verse 12. 12 to 14 than the rest of the, the sections of Scripture. In verse 12 to 14, in most translations, it'll end in this section because John, in this portion, is about to write a poem. 
So you think in all the adversity we're about to experience, uh, John here gets poetic. And I think the reason he gets poetic is he wants to be understood in his, his loving desire for your life and what he wants. And the reason we know this is poetic, you might read through that real quick. We're going to read it in just a second and say, hey, this is not poetry. It does not rhyme. John is not a very good poet. Well, in, in John's day, poetry was not written to rhyme, or at least in Hebrew understanding, it wasn't written to rhyme. Hebrews wrote in what's called parallelism where they would write a, one line and they would write another line that reinforced the first line. And you can see this in John's writing because he talks, about, he talks about children, he talks about fathers, he talks about young men. And then again, he talks about children, he talks about fathers, and he talks about young men. You see this parallelism in his story, but he says this, I'm writing to you little children. That phrase is more like, listen here, I'm I'm driving home a point. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Remember last week we talked about uh, what it means to be a disciple, to be a follower uh, of Jesus and what that looks like in our lives, that it's it's a heart, head, and hands, that that God cares about, uh, about your belief and your behavior driven by your love for him. In your love for God, it should, be, it should be emulated through how you believe and how you behave. That's a disciple of Christ. Your orthodoxy, your orthopraxy. And, and, and here he's noting in the same story he's about to share with us, look, this is how you live then as a disciple of Jesus, that, that what drives being a disciple truly is your identity. You will be a disciple of something in life. You will love something in this world, and what you love will emulate what you believe and how you behave. And it's when you begin to understand your identity in Jesus that you grow in your love for God and begin to to mimic that relationship for which you were called to in Christ. And so he writes here, to little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. This idea of, of, of name is just not like Jesus' name has some sort of voodoo magic, but in Jesus' day, name represents identity. His name, Jesus Christ, is not just a name. His mom's like, you know what? He looks like a Jesus. Let's call him Jesus. His name is a title and an identity as, as much as just his, uh, as his person. Uh, Jesus is, is the saving Messiah. Yeshua, salvation, Christ, the anointed one or the Messiah. It's a title representing everything that encompasses who he is. So when it talks about for his namesake, it's his glory being made known in our lives. And so we have this identity in his glory that our sins are forgiven. So he says, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his namesake. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. This word for know is not just intellectual assent, meaning we talk about being a disciple. We said this last week. It's not about just information. Just because you're good at Bible trivia doesn't mean you're a true follower of Jesus. It's about taking what God says that is truth and applying it to our lives and allowing it to transform us. And so this word know isn't just intellectual knowing, it's relational knowing, it's, per, it's relationship with God. It says, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. And then he begins to repeat it. I'm writing to you children because you know the father. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Here you see in this story that, that, that while John is getting ready to talk about darkness, he wants to remind you of your position in Christ because you are light capable of piercing the darkness through the power of Jesus represented in you. It's why even though the world may be dark around us, even though, even though the world may suppress God's people, that we still walk in victory because we are conquerors in Christ. It's why I don't own a bunker behind my house. Jesus calls us into this world to be difference makers for his glory. And he's spurring on his church in these moments for that purpose. I'm not against bunkers, by the way. If you've got one and something bad happens, please call. <laughs> But when you look at this illustration Paul is using, you see as he's talking about children and young men, fathers, um, the story of scripture is very family focused, community focused. This letter is community focused. Um, Part of the beauty of the early church is uh, they didn't see themselves quite like an organization. I think Anything healthy needs to have some organization to it. Without organization, there is chaos. Anything that's life-giving, life-possessing has to have organization or it will be anarchy and just fall apart, right? Every, every organism has to have organization to survive. But he saw it as something deeper than just an organization. 
It's a family. In fact, the early church was made up of a group of families. When Paul called the church to look for leaders within the church, he said, look for healthy families, families that are walking in light of who Christ is. So Paul, in this story, in, in writing to the early church, he's, he's focusing on the idea of the health of the spiritual family. Now, some people look at this, this poem and they debate, um, why does Paul primarily write this section of scripture to men, right? It's because he's chauvinistic. <laughs> and why, why aren't women included? I, you know, I would say within the, the context of this, when you talk about little children, I think it's, it's not exclusive to just men. It's, it's really male, female in this. But after he talks about little children, he then only mentions the men. Why does he only mention the men? Well, if, if you look at the story, it's, it's written poetically, this section of scripture, so, so it could be mentioning men in a patriarchal society. This is predominantly a patriarchal society. It could be mentioning men poetically, really as an illustration and referencing to everyone. And in fact, if you turn to 2 John and read the beginning of 2 John, you'll see throughout this story that John, rather than mentioning men, he actually refers to the church as a lady. And he uses the illustration of women in the book of 2 John, but here in, in 1 John, he's, he's referencing men. So it could be poetically that John is using this in a patriarchal society to talk to men as an illustration of all people, as an example. Or, or it could be that he's just referencing um, men for a particular reason, because maybe in this society, men needed encouraged. Maybe he's looking at what's happening in, in the place of the church and he's saying, look, where guys are right now in relationship to the church, uh, some men need encouraged to just walk where they are in Christ for what God has, has called us to, to not be just passive, but to see their place and what God desires for them to do for his kingdom and glory in this world. If you pick up commentaries, you read on that, they, they speculate, no one really knows the answer and I don't feel like I need to solve it. I'll just say, let's do both. Let's walk in both. Let's walk in this as if John is just talking to the men for a particular reason, and let's walk in the idea that maybe this relates to everyone and, and, and make the application for us. When you think in terms of, uh, of needing to encourage men, and you look at the first century church, uh, the first century church was a grass movement uh, that, that, that really encouraged uh, the slaves, the lower class of society, and for one of the first times in history, it's giving women identity, worth, value, and meaning, not just this this property to be possessed, but it's showing the identity, and because it's showing the identity of women before the Lord, it's seeing women come to know Christ. It's seeing slaves, lower class society, come to know Christ. And maybe as John's looking out in the church, he's saying, you know what? We're lacking men. You know, when I think about our culture today, I don't think it's any different. Who tends to be a part of a church community more, men or women? Maybe not here, but women. Who tends to be more of the spiritual leader in the home, men or women? Women. I think maybe in this passage of Scripture, John's recognizing the need to continue to encourage the men. Maybe he's thinking about this for a moment and he's recognizing maybe women have more fortitude than the dudes because at the end of the day, women care more about the success of their family than their husbands. And, and, and guys, you know, if you're here this morning, I'm not saying that to, to beat us over the head. Rather, I want to say this, man. If you are here with your family as an individual wanting to grow in God, like more than anything, we don't, we don't need to feel the guilt of this. We need to be encouraging this to recognize what God desires for us to do. So, so this, is, this is to applaud you, to, to spur you, to, to just say, keep being who God has called you to be. Dad, what we want to hand to our family is not a future of lacking clarity in who God has called them to be and why God has created them in this world. But to have an understanding of, of their identity and running with him. We don't measure our worth as men simply by providing earthly possessions for our family with no godly identity. God wants to work in you. And as God works in you, he wants to work through you. This world has plenty of young girls 
looking to fill a, a void in their life in the arms of another man because they lacked the love and grace from their own father. This world has plenty of young men who have no idea the reason for which they exist and because of that, never mature. You know the difference between a boy and a man? A boy needs you to take care of him. A man takes responsibility. A boy is cared for by others. A man cares for others. We learned this a few years on the men's uh, men's retreat. Real men reject passivity, expect God's greater reward, accept responsibility, lead courageously. I think John is using this section of scripture to encourage us to, to say, dads, let God shape your heart so you can be used by God to help others find their, their heart shaped in him. Dads, you are the pastor in your home and your influence isn't to be underestimated. So we think in just terms of masculinity, I think encouraging the men here, but, but maybe because it's written poetically, it could be the identity of just using men as an illustration for the greater picture of the church. In fact, children really encompasses all of us. All of us that belong to Christ, the Bible tells us in John 1.12, as many as received him, to them became the children of God. I think one of the best things to to really understand this passage is is seen in the last section of verse 14. Do you think about how this story goes? It starts with children, then it goes to fathers, then it goes to young men. Children, fathers, young men. And when you look how the story is written, it says something to children. It sort of repeats the same idea when it talks to children again. Says something to fathers, repeats the exact same idea to fathers again when it, when it mentions fathers. And then it talks to young men. And then when it talks to young men at the very end, it, it, for the second time, it adds a larger portion to what he's trying to express to young men. If you were to write a poem, it would make the most sense to say, okay, children, young men, fathers, right? Children, young men, fathers. But rather than do that, what John does in the story is he says children and and older men, and then he says young men. Doesn't follow the age of progression here. Meaning, I think he wants us to highlight the understanding of exactly what he's saying to young men, because this is the final thought he wants us to carry into the battle in which we face in this world as we live as lights for Christ. So look at this. Last half of verse 14. I write to you, young men, Because you are strong. Church, in the midst of darkness, you're not weak. You're strong. And the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the evil. And look, the victory has already been won. When we understand what John is saying here, I think the The key to this passage is in the idea of of abide. Jesus in John 15, last moments with his disciples in the upper room before his crucifixion, he talks to the disciples in verse five. He says, he who abides in me will bear much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. And John is saying now to us, look in this world to yourself, thinking all the pressure's on you to try to make a difference, not connected to Christ. Look, it's not gonna make a difference. But in Jesus, you're already strong. You've already overcome. You don't just cut off the branch that is you and stick it in the sand and expect it to grow. Your health, your vitality, your strength, and everything in this world that's gonna make a difference is how you're connected to Jesus in relationship to him. What kind of difference do you want to make? If you want to build a squash, it takes three months in a garden. You want to build an oak tree, it takes 30 years. What I'm saying is, look, when it comes to making a difference in in this world, Spending time connected to Jesus cannot be underestimated in the strength that it gives you to be a light for him in this world. Um, I remember when I was second grade, my parents gave me one of the greatest gifts. 
a Nintendo. <laughs> Came with the, the power pad and the gun for duck hunting and you know your little AB controller back when controllers had all the buttons that it needed. And, um, and I remember I, I got this controller and they gave me this magazine to Nintendo that unlocked all the secrets to Mario. <laughs> and and I, I got this portion that told me all that I needed to defeat Mario was to get to level 3-1. If any of you guys know level 3-1 from your, your glory days of Mario playing, right? Level 3-1 was the place that you could pin down the turtle and jump on its head repeatedly until you got a, a one-up, right? And new life, and new life, and new life, until you got infinite lives. And then because you had infinite lives, it was just a matter of time before you stormed Bowser's castle and rescued your princess, right? I, I, when, when I figured out this secret, I remember second grade, my mom let me stay up till two in the morning on a school night because I, I finally got all these men and, and then I could, I could make it all the way to the end and, and live my dream as a seven-year-old and defeat the Bowser in the castle, right? And so I got so excited about this. I finally stormed down the gate. I got my first princess, right? And, and, and I remember I woke up the next morning and I was ready to go to school, but I come downstairs and I just have hives all over my body. I was so excited excited about the idea of beating Mario, like the adrenaline pumping so much as a kid. And my mom talks about it's one of those embarrassing stories your family shares. Hey, remember when you played video games and you used to get so excited you'd break out in hives? Like, yes, mom, that was once and stop telling people, right? But, but you know, what I'm saying is, is this, look, when you read verses 12 to 14 and you understand what John's saying from children to fathers to young men, He's saying, look, in Jesus, you've stood on those steps and you've got all the power that you need to defeat Bowser and his castle. God has lied. And he is overcome. God doesn't call you to walk into a spirit of fear. But to remember who you are in Jesus in the midst of this darkness because living in that light makes the difference. Last week, we talked about being a disciple. What you believe, how you behave. And this week now, starting in verse 15, John's talk, gonna talk again about being a disciple, but he's gonna remind us, look, it's not that you can just be a disciple of Jesus, but you can be a disciple of anything. And now he's gonna present to us, while, while there's the idea of being a disciple of Jesus, then there's the idea of being a disciple in this world. And this is what this looks like. He's gonna start sharing this story in verse 15. And he's gonna start by beginning with how you behave. Verse 15 to 17. And then he's gonna continue verse 18 to verse 27 is, is how you believe. And so you think in terms of being a disciple, God, God wants to use this passage and John's using this passage to awaken our minds to recognize that what God calls us to in this world is so important to make an impact because you have overcome. Dude, you're Mario with all the lives. Jesus has given that to you to conquer darkness, to make a difference, to rescue the princess. Only in this case, the princess is his church. To see God be a light in this world. So in verse 15, he says this, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. One of those verses, right? Christians read verses like this and they start to go insane. They think, oh, the world's darkness and I don't want to love the world. The world is bad and you want to hide from the world and become hermits and just say, forget it. I'm not getting that dirtiness on me. And, and so I love Jesus. Forget the world. Let's just hunker together and just all get along in my little, my little holy huddle and, 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 and then don't live out what God has called us to. I mean, that's, that's, some people come to these passages like that and that's how they read this section of scripture. And that is not what John is saying at all. There, there are Christians that just live their Christian lives with, with nothing but don'ts. Don't smoke, drink, or chew, or hang with girls that do, right? Don't, don't listen to that rock and roll. Don't go to those movies. Don't shake those hips. The next thing you know, babies are coming, right? Like, like they just live in a bunch of don'ts. Because hmm. life's short. I don't want to live my life about what I'm against. I want people to know about what I'm for. 
Sure, sure, as you walk in the light, it naturally will recognize things of darkness. But I don't live my life to avoid darkness. I live my life to walk in the light. Now, what God is saying in this passage is not a bunch of don'ts. What God wants us to recognize, again, is where you are and the difference that you can make in this world. So what he's saying in verse 15, he wants us to recognize there are two systems in this world. There's one of the world, and there's one that loves God. And, 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 and you can't love the things of the world and love God. He's talking about systems here. There's a way in which the world perceives things and the way in which, which God perceives things. And we want to walk in light of him in the midst of the world that we live in. Not be... Uh, of the world, but we will be in the world. And so in verse, verse 16, he starts to explain what that looks like. What does that look like to be, to be in the world, but not of the world? In verse 16, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So what does that look like when you're of the world? Well, he's saying this, you wake up every day and the way that you live your life is what's just gonna make me happy. I wanna live for my glory. Lust, greed, power. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. I'm gonna wake up tomorrow and whatever pleases me, I'm gonna use the things around me for that purpose, even if it's people. Because it's all about me. It's all about my pleasure. And John is identifying verse 16. Look, to be of the world, that's what life is about. You wake up tomorrow and you say, my desires, that's what's most important because I am king. But then verse 17, there's a problem with it. It doesn't last. And honestly, if it matters, it only matters for just a moment. Christians will read passages like this and get weirded out, right? Start obsessing with paranoia. I'm embracing the world system, it's all bad, just go away. Make a bunch of don'ts and let's just hide, right? But rather what, what God desires for us to do in the midst of this world is to redeem the culture in which we live in. So being wise about this is important. Because when we think in terms of evil, sometimes we, we create this character in our mind that, that evil is, is like horns and red and pitchforks and it, it's got the lizard tongue, right? That's evil. But, but evil doesn't usually present itself to us that way. Like evil doesn't run around yelling to you, I'm evil, hide. That's not what evil does, right? Evil desires t to lull you to sleep. In fact, here's where it's deceiving is that evil can even look good. Evil just doesn't want God. Like people who live in the system of the world, they can do a lot of good things, but never for God's glory. And if God created all of creation for his glory and we rip that away from him, the question is, is that really good? So, so evil, evil doesn't just come screaming at you that I am evil, but rather what evil does is it wants to, to numb our minds. Meaning we walk in this world and one of the things that happens to us, we start just doing things that the world naturally does. Like, why do you do that? I don't know, everyone else is doing it. Like, why do you, why do you numb your mind on the couch for two hours a day? I don't know, everyone else does it, Right? And so before you know, you start em embracing and mimicking things in your life that you're like, I don't even know why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm just doing it because everyone else around me does it. And John's saying, look, there's two systems in this world. You live for the world's glory or, or God's glory. And the world wants you to mimic its behavior and it will model that for you. And there's a way of recognizing. And then there's God who's called me to live in this world for his glory. And I want to mimic his behavior before this world around me because I love him and I want to live for that. And rather than just say, oh, the world is bad, run away and hide. How do we redeem the culture and take the things of this world? Because ultimately, it really belongs to God. The things that God created in this world, they're not good or bad. They're really just, they're neutral. God wants them for his glory, but it's what you do with them that determines if you use it for his glory. And so God has called his church to go into this world and redeem the things of this world for his glory. Let me give you an example in case that's too pie in the sky. Um, television. Television's a big entertainer, Right? Television is not a bad thing, but it's what you do with it that determines if it's for God's glory or not. I listened to a guy once say, you know, I don't let, I don't let my kids watch TV for the same reason I don't let them drink from the toilet bowl. Like, I, I, I have a TV, I watch TV, I own whatever the jazz network is, I like watching the Utah Jazz, right? I will have a TV forever as long as I can watch the jazz. Um, I'm not saying TV's bad, but it's what you do with it. And do you justify the things that you watch simply by saying, you know, the culture does it. It's got to be okay. 
Like sometimes I'm shocked when I turn on the TV, like my, my TV will tell me the popular TV shows. I'm like, are the, are the first 15 choices really just soft porn? Like, it seems like the popular TV shows today, that's, it's all included in there. It's like, and how does the Christian community embrace this? What, what do we say about things like that? Like, oh, the, the world does it. Right? To think about why we do what we do and redeem it for his glory. I was even thinking this week, what are some of the things that I've heard over the last few days in Christian conversations that people said, don't worry, I'm not going to tell people what we've talked about. But, but yeah, it's funny, one of the things I've listened to Christians say recently was um, you know, the, the lottery, we keep having big lotteries. And Utah doesn't have a lottery, so how are you, we got to drive to what, Wyoming, right? Um, I, I'm not endorsing the lottery. I don't want to change anyone's conviction over the lottery. But, but I've, I heard people talking, you know, if, if someone wins the lottery and they gave it to the church, I, I wouldn't use that. That's, that's bad. Like, people didn't believe that the lottery was a good thing. That's a bad thing. And I just think, you know, I, if someone won the lottery and gave it to our church, I, just, just putting this out there, guys, <laughs> I'm not turning that down, right? I mean, like, I mean, it could end up in the hands of a stripper in Vegas or we could use it for God's glory here. Like, I mean, this is a no-brainer for me. Like, you may not agree with what the lottery is, whatever. But, but if someone could take that and just give it to, to use it for his glory, I'm thinking, look, you, you can read verses like that and say, bad, I don't want anything to do with that. But money itself is not bad. It's what you do with it. And so if you win the lottery, <laughs> right? like, like, let's build churches in Utah, please. We have towns without churches. So, so if you ever have a friend that's like, I, I, I won the lottery, gave me the church, the church said it was bad. I'm like, we will take it, okay? We will take it and redeem it for God's glory. I mean, this everything that exists, like we even had a question recently over, we had Easter, right? And, and um, I love the way the early church does this. I always, this will happen to me every year, I know for the rest of my life, but Easter and Christmas come up and without doubt, someone will come to me and say like, you know, bunnies are of the devil. And then they'll give me the backdrop. Like Easter was of the pagan whatever God of fertility. And that's why bunnies and chickens are there. And, and, and at Christmas, Christmas trees are of pagan idolatry. And I'm like, man, man, the world took bunnies and chickens and trees from us. Jesus made those things, right? Like, I'm taking them back, baby. So, so you know what happens? Like, like, when Easter comes around, like, let's put a sign on our bunny and say, resurrection, buddy. I believe in eternity. Like, we're gonna see bunnies in heaven. They belong to God. God created animals for his glory. Uh, that doesn't belong to the world. It belongs to us, right? And so if I like bunnies, man, on Easter, I'm going to have bunnies. Like, I think the early church, when they looked at holidays, they're like, you know, pagan people worship on Easter, but this is about the resurrection. Let's turn this for God's glory. Uh, the winter solstice, people honor false gods, winter solstice. Let's use this to honor Jesus. I don't, maybe trees have pagan origins. I don't know, but you know what we do? We take a tree, we put it in our home, tradition. I love centering things in tradition with my family. On the top of the tree, a star or an angel. Why? Because we're encapsulating the Christmas story for our family. When Jesus died, or when Jesus came, excuse me, when Jesus came to the earth, the thing that appeared in the sky, a tree and an angel. These are for our kids to tell them the Christmas story. The only thing that has life, only tree that has life in the winter, everything else is dormant. It's, it's the evergreen tree. It's green, it's beautiful, just like Jesus in the midst of darkness brings life. You use these things to illustrate for your family how to redeem the things in the culture for his glory. Now look, I'm not trying to change your conviction over things, but what I want us to recognize is yes, the world does evil things with things that God has created, but God calls us as light in this world to make a difference. We aren't lulled to sleep by the things of this world by doing things just because the world does it, but rather God calls us to be different as, as light for him in this world, to look at the things around us used by the world for the world system and the world's glory and say, look, this belongs to Jesus and I'm living for God's glory and pointing everyone to him. There's different ways you can approach this passage of scripture, right? You can run, hide, hunker. Or you can say, God loves people. God created these things. These things belong to him. And I want people to understand how to use it in light of him, not just to be lulled to sleep because evil doesn't run around saying, look, I'm evil. Rather what we do, we just start to be lulled to sleep. And then we wake up and we say, for my glory rather than his. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. What God wants us to do is live for his glory. I mean, Paul even said it like this, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all for God's glory. Love that. 
Paul's in his own mind trying to think of illustrations. Like I use random things like, like lottery or, or, or I don't know what, what else I use, Easter, Christmas, TV, whatever. But Paul's like, look, everybody's got to eat and drink. And here's the cool thing. When, Adam and Eve cre- when God created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, do you know before Adam and Eve even sinned, you know what Adam and Eve needed? Food. I mean, God told them. It, food, you didn't have to get hungry later because of the part of the fall. Before man even sinned in the Garden of Eden, they already needed to eat because God told them, don't eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All the other trees you can eat from. From the very beginning, you were created as a dependent creature. You needed to drink, you needed to eat. And you know what that was a reminder of? You need a God. And so what Paul is saying in this story is, look, when, when we pray, like if you, if you have a meal and you pray, don't just pray because you're just mindlessly praying because you were taught to pray. Recognize rather in that moment that God within you, in your DNA, he created you in a way that you always needed sustenance for him to make provision for your life. You were created to be dependent. And when you pray before you eat, you're acknowledging the goodness of that God who provides. So whatever you do, don't mind-numbingly just mimic the world. Figure out in your life how you can redeem it for his glory. Eat, drink, whatever you do. Do all for his glory. Let me move on to the last section and be done. I'm gonna read this quickly and then just hit a couple thoughts in here. But first, first John 2, 18 to 25, he then goes from how we behave to what we believe. And he says this, children, it's the last hour. As you've heard, the Antichrist is coming. So many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is, it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for they had not been of us. They would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. Let me just stop right there and say this. Um, This is a sad verse, verse 19. Uh, I think this is probably one of the more painful verses in Scripture because I found in, in ministry the wounds that cut the deepest aren't when the world dislikes you. You expect that. The wounds that cut cut the deepest are when friendships are forced apart, right? Or wedged apart from the inside, the body of Christ. In verse 19, I read that verse and I just think of the pain that might be behind it. They went out from us, but they were not of us. And John refers to this as the last hour in the Antichrist. And again, this is where we could freak out, right? Um, Last hour, what he's saying is, look, we don't need anything else. This is the last chapter that's been written that Jesus has come, Jesus has rescued us. That's the last thing before Jesus returns. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing any perish, but all come to repentance, that God is long-suffering towards us, that God preached this message that we could proclaim the truth that sets people free. This is the last hour. It's like saying this is the last chapter of the book. We're not waiting on any more revelation. This is it. Live for his glory. So you see the sense of an urgency here? It's not to stress you out, but just to recognize where you are. Don't be lulled by this. God has you in a place, and you've already overcome. He's told us. You've already overcome the evil one. So it's, it's the last hour in there, Antichrist. What are Antichrist? Well, again, we think pitchfork in hand, but, but when he talks in terms of Antichrist, what he's saying is teach us something contrary to Jesus. There's what Jesus says, and there's what opposes Jesus. And Antichrist don't walk around just saying, I'm the Antichrist. Antichrist don't even have a problem with things that are good. Antichrist just doesn't want you to follow God. And so he's saying, look, that, that's in this world, but verse 20, but you have been anointed by the Holy One and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. Uh, verse 20, 22, who is the liar, who, but who, he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This, that's, this is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us eternal life. He's saying to us, he even goes on in verse 27, he takes this thought of of abide and anointing and he combines it. So in the the reality of the fact that there there is an antichrist and this is the last hour, John wants us to walk in an identity and it has to do with the abiding and the anointing. What does that mean? When you look at the thought of anointing in scripture, uh, anointing was used in two ways in the Old Testament. A shepherd would anoint his sheep He anointed it for protection. 
They would anoint the head of the sheep so that if bugs would jump on the sheep, mites, fleas, like sometimes they would burrow in the sheep's ear and kill the sheep. So they anoint the face of the sheep so that, so that the bugs couldn't grip a hold of the, the sheep's face and they would fall off. It was to protect the sheep's life. But also in the Old Testament, they anointed, which I think this word anointing is used this way, they anointed their prophet, priests, and kings. It was to recognize that God had commissioned them, that his spirit dwelt with them for them to fulfill the calling that God had placed them for in this world. Prophet, priest, and king. When you get to the New Testament, God, like a prophet, calls you to proclaim his truth. God calls every believer a royal priest, meaning you belong to the king and you are a priest representing people before God. So when we think about this term in the Old Testament, this term anointing was a very special term for God's people called on a special mission for his glory in this world, prophet, priest, and king. And when you get to the New Testament, that same title used for those particular people, Jesus now uses for you. Prophet, priest, king. In the midst of this darkness, you belong to Jesus on a mission for his glory. And the strength of that mission comes through your abiding. Not severing yourself from Christ, but rather walking in light of who he is. As Christians, we can get scared, we can feel defeated, we can talk like we've already lost, not walk in victory. We can act like the weight of the world is on our shoulders. You know, the gospel really doesn't call you to fight for it. The gospel calls you to share it. Jesus can take care of himself. It's like this gospel doesn't need you to fight for it. It just needs you to let it out of the cage and let God take care of the rest. Because if you live in a, in a place where the population's 99% Christian or 1% Christian. What you do for Jesus shouldn't change. Every day, you wake up and live for his glory. The world's gonna do its things regardless, but God calls us to live for Jesus. Last hour, yes, it's the last hour. Antichrist, yes, there's antichrist. There's many antichrists, John said but you are anointed. You're called to abide. You are strong, as he says in verse 14. And you don't surrender the things of God back to this world. What John is encouraging us to is rather than to be lulled by the culture and just embrace the culture simply because the culture does it, is not what God calls you to do. And God also doesn't call you to hide from it. Rather, what God calls you to do is to redeem it. Not fight against people, but for people. To help people understand why we do what we do and how to use it for his glory. In your own life, figuring out how to honor God's kingdom in the world that you live in. If it's worldly, the things that you do, if it's for selfish pleasures, Lose it. But if you can redeem it, redeem it. Whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do it all for his glory.